before the COVID, many people consider that the online educational uh, projects or resources were, well, this is not, it is very difficult to maintain the attention in front of a, a laptop or in front of um, a screen. But the pandemic was very useful in, in our case to learn that that resources are absolutely incredible. It's a fantastic to spread the, the knowledge uh, around the world very quickly. Well, actually, before COVID happened, there was a lot of evidence around virtual learning and blended learning that showed that it's really effective. It's just that in the rush to adapt to COVID, perhaps these lessons hadn't been taken on board. So the, there's nothing wrong with virtual learning or blended learning. It's just that rather than it being implemented as an, as an emergency, it needs to be thought about beforehand and brought into practice properly. Whew. You know, I, I think we have not spent the time and investment in figuring out how learning is actually done. We, we've been on an apprentice model for 400 years in everything, right? Medicine included. And it's just like, watch me do what I do. And there's been, you know, tiny little movements towards like learning theory and understanding and how we actually uh, gain new skills, but not to the extent that actually gives us formulations for how we should be approaching this at the bedside. Free online medical education is on the rise. I think, it's, I think it's certainly the future of medical education. I think how quickly evidence was disseminated through social media, especially Twitter, when COVID arose, is phenomenal. Yes, it had lots of problems with the validity of information and who could comment. But I think if you look at the positives, looking at institutional and expert interactions, it really had great promise for those things. And I think COVID really propagated a need to do this differently, right? There was a huge spirit of collaboration. I think as doctors, we are collaborators anyway. From my own specialty emergency medicine, we are definitely collaborators. And we all found a way of getting together um, to share that knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, William Mosler started off the journal clubs, you know, 100 plus years ago. And the whole point then was to freely share medical information amongst his peers and colleagues. And that was in within a very, very tight network. Now we all want to share information. And at a time when we've been physically distancing and socially isolating, a lot of us don't have the opportunity to mix and mingle at work as we would do. And we can't share these same informations. We don't have doctor's messes and tea rooms and congresses like we do, used to have. And there needs to be an alternate way for our, the community of pediatricians to come together. And I think one of the best ways of doing that is online. So the virtual world is independently of COVID is in our world now and it's reality. And I think that the COVID made us aware that, okay, uh, if we have these tools, then these tools are not coming from the devil. Free Open Access Medical Education, or FOMED, um, uh, as the hashtag, was a term that was coined in 2012. And the, the reason why is because there's all this free open access movement derived blogs and podcasts that were out there in the world. And yet there wasn't really a banner head for it. And so I think a bunch of folks decided that they would create a hashtag so that we could find it all. What is wrong with the traditional ways of knowledge translation? I don't know if there is anything wrong with them. Uh, it's that they don't fill all of the space I think we need for medical education. So textbooks, journals are fantastic for, uh, in the case of textbooks, background knowledge. You, you need to have the knowledge of your domain specialty in order to have a foundation to build upon. And what do journals offer? Well, they offer the up-to-date ideas and techniques of, of where therapeutics, where diagnostics should be, but there's a gap. And the gap I think MCRID and other foam sites fill is the actual implementation of, of that. We could have a nuanced discussion, looking at the evidence, talking a little bit about some of the statistics in a way that you can't do if you're just reading a paper on your own at home, or perhaps you're running in a traditional journal club in your hospital, but we had, the lead authors of these papers being able to critique our critique and come back and answer us in a way that you can't do normally. If someone publishes a paper in a journal, 
you have generally a two week right of reply. If you're doing something online, then you could write an essay in response to what we've said. And we'll very happily include that. When I put out a post or a podcast and I get something wrong, within an hour, I have some of the experts in the field telling me how dumb I am. And that's the best part about Foam and its social media interface is immediate post-publication peer review in a way that cannot be blocked, cannot be avoided. You can't like just sweep it under the rug. The format cannot be um, one single concept. Um, the needs of the consumers vary, uh, just like in any other field. So if you think about free open access medical education as one big circle, it is formed of numerous single pieces. Uh, and all of these fit together, I think, to form that circle. I would like to think that Pico General was just one small part of the jigsaw. Back in 2014, 15, which is when I started off as a consultant, I thought that I should make it uh, some sort of a program so that I can keep myself updated. And then realized that there was no reason that I couldn't just do the same thing, that I do the work anyway to sort of log it, publish it, and to share it with others. So the background of the Dragon's Bites podcast is pretty straightforward, I think. So at the time, I was trying to think of a way where I could teach really complicated topics to the people who were sitting the exams, because it kept being the same things that people were failing on over and over again, congenital cardiac conditions, metabolic, renal conditions, that sort of thing. So I thought, well, maybe if I can bring some consultants in who can share their expertise, that would really help. And then I thought, well, it's only a step more to record what they're doing. So it'll save them having to come back and deliver the same talk every time there's an exam diet. And then I thought, well, it's only one step more to not just record it, but then to just release it as open access med ed to the world so long as they're happy with it. And then anyone in the world can access the same thing. So we're talking about the PIDS ICU Friday quiz. I had a very complex case clinically on retrieval. A child with uh, severe bronchospasm who also had an SVT. But we, with consent and entirely anonymized, we decided to uh, test the waters on social media to see what colleagues would do, to see a number of responses, to see if people would solve it in the same way we solved it clinically. The objective of, of the quiz varied quiz by quiz. Sometimes you try to get the people taking part uh, and this you know became so viral people used to run their weekends by it because we let it run for 48 hours it would come out on a Friday and then you had a myriad of people uh, chipping in and trying to solve the puzzle so either it was a complexity in managing the case or it was trying to get them to reach a rare diagnosis and it only really came apparent to me how useful it could be in the world of pediatrics when you know Tessa Davis reached out to me via the internet as a complete stranger and said, hey, do you want to get together and do something? Before COVID, the stuff that we did was, so it was online, but not in the sense of live streaming online. So we had our website where we delivered a lot of online education in written format or infographic format. And we did face-to-face -face events. So we ran conferences. So we sort of created this network of like-minded, excited, excitable clinicians who would kind of want to make things better. We started out with the blogging in English as well. Um, and I think most Danes and most Scandinavians, they have read all of their textbook in English. So it's not actually a problem. The podcasting in Danish and whatever else we put out there is in Danish is being very well received. Because people, they see that it is core knowledge in our own language, in our own context. So we want to take that part and say, we can also do this as free open access medical education um, and bring the Scandinavian countries and providers, healthcare providers of all kind, even closer together. This group of people were very just interested in doing this kind of work. They want it to be a little bit more open access and free to the world. There was a social mission baked in, just like other open access movements have been, is decrease the walls between learning resources, people and data. We have a new name for the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. 
Hello, admin. This is the ophthalmologist. Ah, ophthalmology. How's it going? It seems I've come down with COVID-19 and won't be in for the rest of the week. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. How'd you get it? Well, I'm not sure. I did go to the hospital a couple days ago to see an inpatient consult. Huh. Did anything unusual happen? Yes. I had to go see an inpatient consult. Other than that... No, not really. I went in, did an eye exam, made sure the patient wasn't going to board an airplane, and then I left. Wait, board an airplane? What are you talking about? Yes, I was told to make sure there were no plans for air travel. Who told you to ask about air travel? There was a sign on the door. Did it say airborne precautions? Yes, that's the one. Seemed like a strange request, but I'm happy to help. Oh, that's not about flying a plane. That so what are the lessons that we need to learn in terms of communicating with the public? Um, uh, we have shown, haven't we, how difficult that is because as a medical community, we're competing against influencers that have multi-million followers and have a, and people who have the public having a, a mistrust of doctors. So in many ways, we can't compete with some of those, um, but all we can do is keep iterating the core messages and the core clinical information well, on Twitter, it's it's very difficult because first and foremost, you have to know who your audience is and who you're communicating to. And in some cases, that can be very difficult to navigate with COVID because there are other academics, there are other physicians who are in the space also competing for an audience. And um, if you are communicating to a general non-technical audience, you want to make sure that your message is tailored to those people. Um, and that can become very tricky and difficult when there's this clash between different academics and different fields and expertise. When it was the start of the pandemic, we were actually due to run a face-to-face -face DFTB course in May 2020. It was Essentials, which was in Birmingham in the UK. And obviously it came to the end of March and it was the pandemic and we didn't know if it would be gone by May. So and um, we made the very bold decision to go online and to do the course online, which seems now like it's a complete no brainer. Obviously, it would be fine. But at the time, believe it or not, it was like a really wild, it was a really wild suggestion. Big challenge to to translate these practical practices, the practical sessions, because with the lectures, we had not so much to do with the bedside practices we changed them to virtual practices we also did some literature research because there were some data that even in subjects which need some practical skills there is evidence that even some video and virtual sessions may be effective no matter where you are no matter what the time is and no matter how much you learn or hear or see the first time you can repeat it. That is some of the very big pros um, that came out of making everything available online during COVID. And I think that suits many learners today. So they were saying how a lot of them increased their use of podcasts. There was one person whose podcast use decreased, and that was because they would only listen to podcasts on their way to university or on their way to placement. And without that an option anymore, they stopped listening to podcasts altogether. But for the most part, they listened to more podcasts to sort of fill in the gap that was left behind. The question you're asking me how I think COVID-19 affected the quality of uh, medical education in Uganda. Well, we had an abrupt kind of closure of medical school, which was emotionally something that hit majority of us first. Some of us were in the middle of clinical rotations and then you have to leave within 24 to 48 hours. Mentally, it didn't uh, treat us well. All of us had to sit home waiting for when our institutions would come up and step up to help us continue learning. Some students who were able to be creative were able to use to develop different strategies of how they could continue learning medicine. In that process, that's where I conceived an idea with support of a mentor I met 
having invitations of expertised doctors from across the globe being able to offer some time to educate us on this and that and share skill and knowledge. How we used to learn is usually after Zoom class, a lecturer would share their slides that have been presenting to an individual, and then that person who is usually like the leader of the class would have to share that PowerPoint in a WhatsApp group of the class. And then it's from that WhatsApp group where each student ideally should be, but some actually aren't, because some even can't afford to have a mobile uh, smartphone, and they have to be unfortunately left behind. But what we used to do is to phone call one another that, hey, hello, we discuss this and this, and hopefully when we meet again, we'll be able to discuss with you what we went through and just try and sympathize with one another. Well, we got the knowledge to teach people in, a, in the easiest way possible. Can we do something to improve the knowledge regarding mechanical ventilation, considering that the pandemic it was uh, a nightmare related to the mechanical ventilation topic. Many people with not good basis in mechanical ventilation had to treat patients in the ICUs. We did some very interesting things as well, looking at you know having grand round speakers from around the world and around the institution without them necessarily having to come here. And I think that's a, a great opportunity. It certainly is environmentally friendly. It decreases the sort of travel burden that pe that people will have in leaving families and things like that. And so I think there were some really interesting ways that we were able to to be pushed to think outside the box that we were used to doing. I was lucky enough to to be involved with a podcast with this um, med ed researcher from Canada, Dr. Victoria Luong. She wasn't just thinking about the impact of COVID on medical education, but on medical educators. So what happened to the people who were trying to teach during COVID? And she looked at it from a phenomenological perspective. And what she found that there was this intricate balance when, when educators were trying to adapt to COVID between grief and relief. And both of those were rotated around the loss of old teaching formats. So there was a lot of grief for the loss of being able to see their students face to face and teaching in a, in a way that was familiar. There's also a lot of relief around that as well, because suddenly that opened up new possibilities and there's this rush of gratitude for the opportunities that were afforded them. So whilst I could be sitting here in my pajamas, you know, talking to my students, that's wonderful. And it makes life a lot easier. And it makes it easier for educators with other needs, whether that's care needs or family commitments. It does mean that you have to be learn to engage in a different way. You can't just teach the same way you used to teach. You can't just put the same PowerPoints up. I think you're trolling me now because you, you, know, you know the answer to that. My pet hate is people taking a talk that they were going to give face to face and just turning on Zoom, sticking up their slides on the main screen and reading through it to you like you were there seeing their face. It's, it's a waste of an opportunity. You know, you're competing and then as an educator with things like Netflix and other, you know, online streaming platforms. Why would I want to watch a lecture from someone when I could just watch a recording and fast forward and copy down the most important points. When you deliver online, you, you have to work harder to build a connection with the audience. It's not as easy because you can't see the cues, the body language. You're not getting the feel of the atmosphere like you do when you're standing on a stage or delivering at the front of a lecture hall. You have to work harder and you have to think about, well, how am I going to make this work online? How am I going to keep people's attention? How am I going to get the audience to talk because they might be more reluctant online? How am I going to stop them switching their camera off and walking away? That's the new stage of what we're learning about now. I'm recognizing that, you know, Zoom fatigue is a real thing and we get tired sitting, just like we would get tired sitting in a classroom for an hour at a time, sitting staring at a computer screen for an hour or for three hours is impossible for most of us. And it is normal to feel you've got a headache at the end of the day. Right, so I think there are a few lessons 
to take from this whole experience with the pandemic and social media-based science communication. First, physicians play an important role in this discussion. And I think that globally, we're starting to realize that. Before the pandemic, I don't think that the general public had access to the medical community in this way. So I think that with that, as I think it was Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) Just recognizing that your degree holds a lot of weight. The public trusts medical professionals when they see a physician or a nurse, they automatically have a sense of trust. So making sure to not violate that trust when communicating with the public is critical. Sharing resources for the benefit of others. Um, The focus is on um, helping people consume the right kind of um, uh, resource. So anything that I think is of good quality is valid, even if it is not curated by me. We need to encourage collaborations between our international colleagues and we, the local in uh, faculties on ground. And in such collaborations, we would love to see like share of resources that we would otherwise not have access to. And so it becomes a two-way conversation. It becomes, again, it's that network of people and that community of practice that we would never have developed otherwise. I 100% believe that COVID was a disruptor in medical education. In fact, if anything, it was a catalyst in medical education. A lot of the things that were being developed around the realms of blended learning and virtual learning had been coming along quite slowly. COVID came along and forced us to adapt really quickly. And so I think it's been a great opportunity for the phone med community and the simulation community. And I think also it's given a chance to push boundaries in education and try new things. We've had to hone in our minds, what is the purpose of being in person? What's the purpose of actually being together? What's the purpose of a whole day course or a three day course? Yeah. And and now we're talking on the positive side of well-planned, well-delivered education during the pandemic. We also learned that making online education is not something you just do. You can't just stand up and record your lecture because people will fall asleep like they would do in the lecture hall. The problem is they both should exist. And lectures have gotten a bad name because most lectures are really, really horrible. Um, But there are ways to give amazing lectures and uh, they should be used. I I, I don't think you get rid of the lecture hall. In fact, some of the best podcasts I listen to are these things where they're just taking these amazing university professors and, and just filming their lectures because they're extraordinary. What is very important that we 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 shouldn't use only virtual uh, platforms now, so we have to keep the balance. The idea of having supplemental material in terms of a video, podcast, a blog has become more natural. We can learn beforehand and we can repeat afterwards, which is the way learning is supposed to be. Spaced repetition, we need that. Going forward, what we're going to look at is a much more accepting educational community around blended learning approaches and virtual learning. I think it's going to be very much the norm now because it's been all we've had for two years. Now you've got both options available to you because some stuff's face-to-face and some stuff's online. How do you know which is the best platform? And the answer is that there's not one answer because it depends what you're trying to do, who you're trying to reach and how you want to do it. So these are just platforms for delivering learning. The learning and the content and the audience, these are the core parts. So when you've got a a teaching opportunity, who's in the audience, what are you there to teach them and therefore what's the best way to do that? And make your time matter, Um, make it matter. Medical education is a passion with the understanding that it's almost a Hippocratic responsibility to share and disseminate knowledge, and everyone starts to benefit from that.